Welcome to Week Five of How China Works. I'm Ying Ying Li, and I'm Brendan Davis. Today's topic is all about the cultural value of money in China. We'll start with some historical context pre-opening up from ancient times forward. Then we'll look at the early days of the PRC from the 50s to the opening up, and how the priorities of the time were shaped, as they always are everywhere by money. Then the rest of the week, we'll look at other aspects of money, including the mostly cashless society here today, investing in China, and more. One quick note is that if you're new to the show, we hope you'll find what you're looking for here, of course. But we also want to hear from you in general. If we haven't covered your topic already, we hopefully will soon. And we're also happy just to get messages from you. You can check the show rundown at howchinaworkspodcast.com to see what topics we've done already and what's coming up next. One last note before we launch is that since we are at the halfway point of season one, we thought we'd change our release schedule to being time for the U.S. work week Monday through Friday mornings there as sort of an experiment. Right. So if you are a subscriber in or close to China time and wonder what happened to us, good evening. Hey, we're fun. <laughs> we'll be timing our release schedule for 8 a.m. New York time Monday through Friday, which is 9 p.m. here. Ironically, podcast studies often show highest listening during morning commutes in the West and at Night in the East, interestingly. So this may be better suited to everybody's internal clocks, anyway. Speaking of that, big show, gotta go.、Oh, thanks, got a little lost in the intro here. Now where's that music? <laughs> Okay, to get us into this one, let's start with a little history of China's relationship to money. It is a long one, yeah. Yes, it is. China is one of the first countries in the world to use currency, and the history of using currency has lasted for five thousand years. In the process of the formation and development of ancient Chinese currency, it has experienced six major evolutions. Archaeologists think China's earliest currency was shellfish, which is also the general consensus of most historians who specialize in that topic. Now there is. Some disagreement, but they mostly think this money was first used in the Xia Dynasty. This is the one right before the Shang Dynasty, and that's the one that we have fairly complete records of, and that's kind of where known history really starts. But the people who know this stuff say it's likely to be true, so we'll roll with it. If you study the ancient Chinese text structure, you see that most of the words related to value, 价值 have the radicals of bei, literally shellfish, evolved from the bei's characters. Almost all the words describing people's market trading methods and social life relate to payment and trading activities include bei. This usage seems widespread in ancient China to refer to a money gift or a debt, like we would understand today, and also in other forms of payment. Right, like the currency used in the sale of goods, property transfers, lease payments, things like that. After Qin unified China, Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor,、mm -hmm. created China's earliest monetary law in the year 2000 BC, stipulating that the half of the money in the round hole of the Qin state was passed nationwide. It was during the Song Dynasty that paper money first appeared, and there's a lot of history about the evolution of the currency itself that make for a great two-hour podcast. But to keep a ten-minute one on track, let's skip a few grooves in this record and jump ahead to how people in China came to value the money that they and others have instead. Great idea. Deng Xiaoping is known inside China for many things. To the outside world, it's mostly for the opening up of seventy-eight. But his famous Thousand Tour planted the notion of entrepreneurship in people's head in such a way that it grew in sync with the. Country's development. One thing that's obvious to anyone who spent time here or has good interactions with people from here is that Chinese people are really willing to work hard in order to have a good life. There's a phrase that translates loosely as "sustain the bitterness of life." What's that meaning? <laughs> well, you have to remember that anyone in their seventies now was born into a time of massive hardship for the vast majority of the country back in the 1950s, and they know poverty, so they not only expect to work hard, it's All they knew how to do. They were also great at saving money. Yeah, you told me the other day that the Brazilians you worked with and lived amongst a few years have a special term of admiration for the Chinese business people they deal with there. Yeah. Yes, it's negócio chinês, which actually means Chinese business in Portuguese. Ooh, very nice. The Brazilians have their own styles doing business that have a little overlap with ours, so the Chinese have a general good reputation with them for it. Something else we know from history is that even from the early days, Chinese really admire people who can make money, and they like people to share this information too. Sometimes they want what amounts to an overshare from a Western perspective, though. So it's something to be aware of, prepare for, and try not to be offended by. So let's try a role play. Inging, pretend you've never been to the West. Oh, okay.、Um, hi, I'm Brendan. 
I sing sing. <laughs> ah, nice. I see what you did there. How much money do you make? Um, I make enough to get by. How about you? And sing. We did that to make you laugh, and of course, that's not as common as it used to be. But how much money you make is still seen as a really important measure of success based on the old school culture. And being frank like that isn't seen as rude. It's actually a sign of people feel comfortable with you. Maybe too comfortable sometimes, but I hear you. And I rarely hear it that much anymore. At least not in the big cities. Just sometimes when traveling to smaller ones, and even then, not too often. Something that is still common in the bigger city relates to that work at. Thing you brought up, whether the pressure comes from the company or their peers or themselves, people do sometimes die from working too hard here. That's a sad situation. We'll look at work habits more on the future episode, also. But for now, duly noted, keeping the focus on money is China still as big on saving as they used to be. That shifted around back and forth a bit, yeah. Saving versus spending is the constant yin yang of money here. China has long been a saving society, but not long ago it moved to more of the crazy spending mode called upgraded consumerism, 消费升级 Gee, I wonder where y'all learned that great habit from. <laughs> it is a mystery, and of course, it's not sustainable here either. Which any good money-oriented podcast will tell you in general. Luckily, much like in the West, the younger generations here have been moderating back to more of a saving mode, whether by necessity or philosophical choice. Part of the problem is that technology enabled the craziness, right? Exactly. Between QR codes, barcode payment, IC chips, etc., spending has become a bit too easy. This led to the other modern trend we'll mention today: downgraded consumerism, 消费降级 That's basically the idea of have a few good things and only what you really need, instead of bigger, better, more, twenty four seven. Being careful with your money is kind of the new black here, and it's also impacting people's investing attitude. Jack Ma had a good quote about this. He often does, I've noticed. What's Uncle Jack say? Oh, in China we call him Ma Baba. Or Daddy Jack? Okay, there's no way I'm calling another grown ass man Daddy, but I've heard it a few times myself. Okay, moving on. <laughs> The quote I'm thinking of here is simple: Chinese people are more rational in saving, but more emotional in investing. And financial professionals globally will tell you that that's a sucker strategy, at least the second part. Now, my own financial role models might as well have been casino operators, <laughs> but in theory, at least in the U.S., the emphasis is the opposite. Jack gave the example that Chinese rush into stock purchases these days, but there's an old saying. Naturally, it's called 省吃俭用 which literally translates as "My mom saved everything." <laughs> it's often used to express implied Chinese language that you come from a frugal background. It's wise advice to heed too. After all, families get wealthy by saving, not spending. People here like safety, and it's understandable. You pointed out to me offline that older people here either remember or heard their parents talk about eating tree bark when they were growing up. For God's sakes, so the emphasis on frugality is very understandable. Sadly, that's true, but it does help explain the bargaining culture. A feeling of scarcity is super hard to overcome once it plants inside of you. In China, those rules go deep. Still, a few people manage to not be bothered by it. Maybe they were born with money, or maybe they have just earned a lot of it lately. But the phrase "有钱任性 applies to them. This means that if you have money, you can do whatever you want. Both crazy spenders having fun, as well as the occasional too rich jerk, embody this attitude. And boy, do marketers cater to them. And that's not unique to China. In order to attract more Chinese tourists, though, duty-free shops in many international airports have actually been designed with lots of subtle and not so subtle Chinese design elements. In their eyes, the Chinese are the biggest luxury market they can count on, and they go after them hard. Yes, there are many people here, and the gap between the rich and poor is large. Many poor people can not even. Go out of the country during their entire lifetime. However, if rich people spend tens of thousands of dollars to buy something, they don't have to think about it. There's a lot of unfairness, and I don't know how we resolve it, but we should figure it out. Preach it, ying ying. And of course, to their eyes, rich or aspirational locals think that the consumption of expensive goods improves their social status and identity. Many foreign brands like D and G, yep, go in there again, have preyed on and served that market aggressively. That reflects the rich Chinese taste for things like foreign luxury. Goods and jewelry, but this will change and improve over time. And the D and G debacle is worth underlining, not to rub their noses in it even more, because I think that's kind of unnecessary、yeah. at this point, but to encourage people to reflect on the necessity of buying all that crap in the first place. As we wrap it up, there are three money dangers for young people that are very common and worth noting. One is that the money they make 
does not sustain their lives. Two is that they therefore borrow a lot, and three is that they too often bet on investment to save them. This is also not a sustainable practice, and there is not an easy solve for it. When season two starts in January, we'll kick things off with several special guests helping us to frame the most pressing challenges facing the generations in the next few years, so that we can hopefully get ahead of all this in our conversations. Until then, though, this is a good chat to start. Thanks, Ingy. Thanks, Brendan. <laughs> So today we dug into the whys a lot, but the rest of the week's shows will look more at the what's in the house. Yeah, and it's a big week, so we better wrap it up. Any closing thoughts, Inging? Just this: money cannot buy everything, but if you're not careful with it, it can destroy everything. So be careful. Good advice. Okay, that's all for today. I'm Brendan Davis, and I'm Inging Li. See you tomorrow on How China Works.